Hello once again, friends, neighbors, and fellow Christians, and welcome back to another lesson in this series where we are studying and investigating the last day's kingdom that was foretold by Moses and the prophets that it would come in the last days. And as Daniel uh, foretold, that it would break in pieces and consume together all these kingdoms, and it would stand forever. And we're looking at our, our study at this point is on the resurrection, one of the promises that, were, that was associated with the coming of the kingdom. We've been studying 1 Corinthians 15, if you're new to the series. Again, please go back and start at the beginning and come up to speed in uh, this series. But we are studying 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're down to verse 54, where Paul says that when the incorruptible or excuse me, when the corruptible would put on incorruption, when the mortal would put on immortality, then would be brought to pass the saying that is written. And he quotes from Isaiah 25, 8, which is part of the little apocalypse as we have been looking at. So we've been looking and studying from Isaiah 25, particularly, but expanding somewhat, and looking at the context. And we're looking at this because... Uh, inquiring minds want to know. We, we want to know why Paul would quote from an Old Testament passage and say that the resurrection would be the fulfillment of that passage that he quotes there in Isaiah 25 and verse 8. And we want to look at that, and we've been looking at that because Paul, nor Jesus, nor any of the apostles, they did not quote Old Testament texts out of context. And we've actually had people, futurists, to argue that they do, and they did, and they just put a new meaning on it. No, I'm sorry. Uh, that just doesn't work. There is no basis whatsoever, except for human opinions, for that conclusion. Paul said that his eschatology was based solely on Moses and the prophets, Acts 26, verse 22. Now, that's what Paul said. I didn't make that up. Read it for yourself. Acts 26 and verse 22. Paul said that his hope of the resurrection was the hope of Israel. Acts 28 and verse 20. Paul also said there is one hope. Ephesians 4, 4 and 5 there. So, he also said that the resurrection of the just and the unjust, quoting from Daniel 12, was about to occur. Acts 24 and verse 15. He also said that the judgment was about to occur. Acts 17 verse 31. Again, Acts 24 verse 25 when he was talking there to Felix. And you know, Felix trembled. Paul reasoned with him on righteousness, temperance, and the judgment that was about to be. Now, that's the actual text. The King James doesn't say that. But that's what the actual text says. That's what Paul said to Felix. And Felix trembled. You can understand why when you see the eminence of what Paul said. And so, we have been in this series, uh, uh, this series of investigative learning. And that, that's what we're doing. Paul said that the things written aforetime was written for our learning. That's what he told his audience. He said those things were written for their learning. So when Paul quotes from an Old Testament prophecy or text, then it makes nothing but good sense for us to go back and look at that text and look at the surrounding context. So that's what we've been doing. And so in Isaiah 25, we have looked at some of these verses here from verse 1 and verse 2. Which, which deals with the destruction of the temple. And then in verse 12, which deals with the destruction of the temple, which again, Jesus quoted verse 12 in Luke 19 as he was looking out over the city and weeping. And he applied that verse, that prophecy, to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so we have this inclusio discussion, this bracketed discussion prophecy here in Isaiah 25, 1 through 12, the whole chapter, this is an inclusio prophecy. 
And so when we look at these things, all of these things will be in that day, verse 9, not in one, just one day, but in that, that time, that era, that kairos, that appointed time. Okay? And so these things would take place, and that's, again, Paul quotes verse 8, he will swallow up death and victory. And he says that would be fulfilled in the resurrection. And remember, Jesus said that all things written would be fulfilled in and by the fall of Jerusalem, Luke 21 and verse 22. So we are looking at verse number 6, right here in Isaiah 25. Now he said, and in this mountain, and in our previous lessons, we have identified the mountain. Shall the Lord of hosts and in our last lesson, we looked at, um, last couple of lessons, We, I think it was two lessons back, we looked at how this Lord of Hosts is used. But anyway, uh, I showed you and I told you that we were going to be addressing the timing a little more aggressively in our study. And that's when I showed you, and I built that argument uh, that I showed you there, proving that the resurrection would be in the first century. Now again, if you if you haven't seen the previous lesson, please go back and watch it. But we're looking here now, in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all the people a feast. Okay? A feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, fat things full of marrow, of wines on the leaves well refined. And we want to talk a little bit more about this feast because again even the uh, secular scholars the futurist scholars will look at this and they will uh, admit they will agree that this is referring to what they call the great messianic wedding banquet this great feast so this is what we want to look at for a little while in this lesson uh, right here and then perhaps in the next lesson I want to return to the argument that we built in the previous video, the previous lesson, and I want to define some of the terminology to show you some interesting concepts and thoughts there. All right, so when we think about the wedding feast or the wedding banquet, and, and again, let me show you this. When we look at the word feast, the original word, it means drink, by implication, drinking the act. Also, by implication, a banquet, or generally, feast. All right, so that's why we get the idea of a feast. And if it's a feast of wines on the leaves, then that's including drinking, okay? Drinking uh, the things that were associated with the feast. So, in looking at this constituent element, we want to use that term, of the feast. I want to notice, and I want you to look at and read the parable that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter 22. Now again, when we look at the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, most people have tunnel vision, and they just look at chapter 24, or maybe even just a portion of, of Matthew 24. Many people, the only thing they see is verse 36. No man knows the day or the hour, but that's, that's a side note. What most people don't realize is the context of this discussion begins here in chapter 22. Why do I say that? Well, look at verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto, okay? So the parable that he's going to give is regarding the kingdom of heaven. Well, the context of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, is the coming of the kingdom. When you look at Luke's record of the Olivet Discourse, and he said, when Luke records Jesus as saying, telling them, when you see all of these things, know you that the kingdom of God is not at hand. So the context of the Olivet Discourse is not just the destruction of the, the material destruction of the city and the temple. It includes the coming of the kingdom. And if it includes the coming of the kingdom, and it does, then it includes the second coming. 
because the only coming of the Son of Man was going to be his coming in his kingdom. And again, we've demonstrated that in previous videos, vi vi uh, previous lessons there. All right, so in Matthew 22, Jesus spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways. Now, now hang on to this. They went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. Because we want to see that same element in another place. All right, now verse 6. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them, entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and, notice, burned up their city. Then, when? When he destroyed the murderers and burned up their city. Then, saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. So again, what is the timing? And remember, I said we're going to address the timing a little more aggressively. What is the timing? What does this text record Jesus as saying? What are Jesus' words here regarding the timing of the wedding that it was ready? When the king sent forth his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Now, folks... You got to get this. You got to understand Jesus is talking about the coming of the kingdom and almost all futurists admit that the kingdom came in the first century. Now the dispensationalists have a, a different idea, which again, when you look at Daniel 7, Daniel 12, and the way Jesus applies those prophecies that refutes that idea as well. But when you look at this, this parable is talking about the coming of the kingdom. So if the coming of the kingdom occurred in the first century, I mean, even if you go ahead and argue it was Pentecost, it wasn't, but just that's first century. We just get in the right century. And again, that's what Jesus said. This generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Even though he didn't specifically name the day and the hour he gave the generation. He, he, he specified the century in which it would occur. So, if we get in the right century of when the kingdom arrived, then we cannot ignore and we cannot deny that that's the time of the wedding. I mean, that's what he said. There's no interpretation here. There's no opinion here. That's what Jesus said. That's what the text says. And as I tell people, you know, this is what it says. This is what Jesus said. Now you have to deal with what Jesus said. It's not my opinion. It's not my interpretation. That's what the text says. Jesus said, when the kingdom would come, that is when the marriage was ready. Now, who would argue that a wedding banquet would last for 20 or so generations, indefinitely, maybe another thousand, because we don't know, even those who uh, ascribe to the end of time idea will admit they don't know when it would be. So, I mean, it, it, it just butchers the context. It butchers the text. And just to be blunt about it, it makes a liar out of Jesus. Jesus said it would be the coming of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like unto, and that's when the wedding would be ready. All right, but let's go on. Now, 
again, in the previous lesson, this is one of the texts that I used, and I think this may have been the one that I closed with, I closed the argument with. It says that, uh, remember, Jesus went to a feast, and he told the person who invited him to this supper, he said, when you make a dinner or supper, don't call your friends or your brethren or your kinsmen or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you, and then a recompense be made to you. He said, but when you make a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot recompense you, for you will be recompensed, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, in other words, the man sitting at meat said unto Jesus, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And so this is how, again, we don't have to interpret anything here. That's what Jesus said. This is what Luke records this person sitting there eating at the feast as saying. And Jesus didn't correct him, say, no, 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 that's not right. Now, that, that's going to be 2,000 years or more in the future. No, he didn't say that. He said that the, that the reward, you would be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, again, go back. If you haven't watched the previous video, go back and look at that where I show and, and demonstrate how you line up through parallelism, these ideas, these thoughts, okay? Now, here's what I want to go to, because if we keep reading, now remember, the man sitting at meat with them said, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. The very next verse in Luke, then said he unto them, Jesus said unto them, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, so invited many, and he sent his servant, at supper time, to say unto them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed or told showed his lord those things then the master of the house being angry said to his servant go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor the maimed the halt and the blind you see the connection there to what what he had just told the man that invited him to the feast and the servant said lord it is done even as you have commanded and yet there is room and the lord said unto the servant Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. None. Notice that. None. <laughs> none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So, again, if you notice the connections here that we looked at in the previous parable, that uh, when they were invited, it says they made light of it. They, they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. So we see the same elements, the same constituent elements here in what Jesus says, recorded in Luke 14, which is in response, notice this, it is in response to the man saying, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God, which was the reward that would be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Do you see that? And Jesus told him, you invite the poor, the lame, the maimed, and the blind. Well, that's what he said here. None of those that were bidden, they're, they're not going to eat at my feast. They're not going to eat of my supper. You go out and call the lame, the poor, the maimed, and so forth. So again, we see the same element. We see these connections. Again, again folks, once you see these connections, you cannot unsee them. But let's keep going here in Luke. Look at Luke 19. Luke 19, beginning in verse 11. And we're going to have to go there because the pop-up uh, is a little larger than the screen. So let me lock that. Let's go to Luke 19. Luke 19 and verse 
11. Now, again, this was, uh, this was when uh, Jesus went home with Zacchaeus, when you back up and read the previous verses here. And, you know, Zacchaeus told the Lord there in verse 8, uh, uh, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore unto him fourfold. You know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector for the Roman government, a public, and he was the chief of them. And this is how honest, being a Jew, this man was. He said, if I make a mistake and take too much, I, I restore that to him fourfold. I'm sure that he would do that out of his own pocket. He wouldn't take it out of the Roman government's uh, till uh, to give that back to them. But again, this demonstrates how honest this man was. Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. You see that? Publicans. The publicans were Jews, Israelites. Therefore, they were children of God, sons of God by birthright. So when you look at, I think it's in the previous chapter here of Luke, the parable that Jesus gives to those who were rich and they trusted in themselves, they were self-righteous, and he gave that parable there of the rich man and the publican that went up into the temple, and the publican stood and prayed and smote on his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And people today will take that out of context and say, now see there, there was a sinner praying and he was justified. No, he was a son of God. He was already a, a child of God. He was not a Gentile that prayed for salvation and the Lord saved him. Sorry, it doesn't work. Publicans were Jews, children of God by birth. All right, so verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save them uh, which are lost. Verse 11, And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought, now notice this, that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Do you see their misconception? You see, when there was a misconception, then it's pointed out by the writer. I see back in chapter 17, verses 20 and following, Jesus told those people on that occasion that when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he said the kingdom comes without observation. So here again was this prevailing mistaken idea that the kingdom of God was going to be something that would ocularly appear, something visible to the physical eye. And so this is another reason that he speaks this parable. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, now, you have to realize, you have to get this, this point right here, folks. Jesus is speaking this parable in regards to the coming of the kingdom. Because some people had the mistaken idea that the kingdom would immediately appear. The nobleman, and if you can understand the basics of these parables, that is referring to Jesus. That Jesus was going to go away and receive a kingdom. Okay, The nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. He told his servants... Occupied till I come, and then he returns. And then he reckons with the same servants that he gave the ten pounds to. See the point? He returned during the lifetime of those to whom he gave the ten talents, the ten pounds. Do you see that? And I already gave that away, the ten talents. This is parallel with the parable of the talents, which follows... The parable of the wedding in Matthew 25. All right, so, and it came to pass that he was returned, having received the kingdom. Then he commanded these servants to be called to him to whom he had given the money. 
that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. The first came and said, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto them, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. The second came and said, Lord, your pound has gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is your pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin, because I feared you, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up where thou layest not down, and you reap where you did not sow. And so Jesus responds to this by saying, out of thine own mouth will I judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, taking up that which I laid not down, reaping that which I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest thou not my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury, or he would gain, he would gain interest by putting it in the bank. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds and they say and they said unto him lord he hath ten pounds for i say unto you that unto every one which hath shall be given and from him that hath not even that he hath shall be taken away from him now notice this but those mine enemies which would not that i should reign over them bring hither and slay them before me and when he had spoken, when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. Okay, so, again, we see these same elements that we have looked at in this parable in Matthew 22, the parables we see in Luke 14. And here again, we have the nobleman going away to receive a kingdom and returning during the lifetime of those to whom he gave the money to, and then slaying those his enemies. What did Paul say that, that Christ was doing? As we, as we have been studying in 1 Corinthians 15, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Do you remember that? 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 24, and three or four verses following right there. He was slaying his enemies. So we have the same thing in this parable here. And this, this, again, we have the same elements that we see in Matthew 22, that the king sent forth his armies. He destroyed those murderers, that's slaying his enemies. And he burned up their city. So again, we see the same elements here. All right, now... Um, I want to get back to Isaiah 25. All right, now, as we go on, I want to consider Matthew 8, verses 11 and 12. Again, back up and read uh, read above and below to get the context. This is when the man came to him uh, with the uh, child that was ill, asking Jesus to uh, heal uh, the child. And... You know, Jesus said, okay, let's go. And the man said, well, now I'm, I'm a centurion and I'm over a hundred men and, and so forth and I'm not worthy for you to even come under my roof. Just speak the word and it'll be so. And so this is Jesus responded to that by saying, I have not seen such great a faith, no, not in, in Israel. And it says here in verse 11 then, and, and I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, now, parallel to that is found in Luke chapter 13, where Luke records the words of Jesus as saying, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you, that would be the sons of the kingdom, when you, We'll see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets 
in the kingdom of God, and you, again, that's Israel, that's the Jews who uh, ultimately killed Jesus, and you yourselves thrust out, that's the sons of the kingdom, the children of the kingdom, and they shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And again, as we've looked at in Luke 14, that they would sit down at Messiah's table in the kingdom to eat bread. And this would be the repayment that would be the reward for good works. So as we compare and look at the two parallel texts here, Matthew 8, 10 through 12, and Luke 13, 28 and 29, then we have to ask the question, have the sons of the kingdom been cast out? I mean, think about it. And I don't know, I don't recall ever encountering anybody in any discussion that has argued that the sons of the kingdom have not yet been cast out. Uh, but even if they do or did, that is a futile assertion. That is a futile argument because if that were the case, then the law of Moses remains in full force. And that causes all sorts of problems. So the sons of the kingdom have been cast out. And that's what Paul said in his allegory in Galatians chapter 4 where he's contrasting the two covenants, specifically naming the two covenants. Ishmael and Hagar, which represented the Jerusalem that now is, he says. Sarah and Isaac, that represented the new Jerusalem that is above. All right? So he says then, Nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So again, we have to ask the question, have the sons of the kingdom been cast out? Well, if they've been cast out, then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets have sat down in the kingdom of God. So, guess what? That begs the next question, that if or since, since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets are in the kingdom, but they were in Hades, how did they get from Hades into the kingdom without resurrection? See that, folks? Again, I mean, this is it's so simple, actually, when you look at it, but it is irrefutable. If you admit that the sons of the kingdom have been cast out, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets are in the kingdom. The wedding has taken place, which means the resurrection has taken place. Now, I told you we were going to pursue a little more aggressively the timing, and that's what we're doing. We are establishing this point after point, time after time, lesson after lesson, the timing. And you cannot get around, nobody can get around the timing. When we harmonize the scriptures, when we allow scripture to interpret scripture. All right, now we're going to look at Matthew 25. And as I just said, you know, I just gave away the one parable there because the parable of the wedding here, the parable of the bridegroom in Matthew 25, 1 through 13 is followed immediately with the parable of the talents. Then it is followed by the judgment scene. So you see how, the, how those line up. You have the time of the wedding. The king sent forth his army, destroyed those murders, burned up the city. That's the judgment. It's just a different terminology, but it's the same elements. All right, so in Matthew 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Hang on, we're going to come back to that, to meet, here in just a minute. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So the wise had an extra container. They had a canteen, in other words, uh, filled with oil, extra oil. All right, so while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight, the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go you out to meet him. Again, that's the same word used in verse 1. We're going to come back to that. Then, that's at the cry, the bridegroom comes. 
Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there be not enough for us and you. In other words, if we divide what we have, then we'll all run out. Nobody will have enough. So sorry, can't do that. So they said, But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. So while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. In other words, they, the bridegroom came, they weren't ready. They were gone. And they that were ready went in with him. Notice what they did. Please notice what they did. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch, and this is the point of his saying here. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Now, again, we're going to go here to Matthew 25 because I want to show you a few things. Actually, I've got to unlock that. I want you to notice some connections here. Number one, I want you to notice here in verse 13, based on what he has just said, this parable that he gave of the bridegroom being likened to the kingdom, the ten virgins being likened to the kingdom, he gives that because to teach them Watch, therefore, why? Because you know neither the day nor the hour. That's exactly what he said in chapter 24, verse 36. No man knows the day or the hour. But again, Jesus specified the century, even though at this particular point, he did not specify the day and the hour. Again, folks, it, it's, it's so remarkable that people will look at this verse. They, In other words, they will deny, they will ignore the forest for one little pine needle that they're looking at. That, that's essentially what they're doing. Jesus specified the century. He specified the generation. Even though he didn't specify which pine needle it would be at that particular point. All right, again, same thing he said in Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. And again in verse 44, therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. All right, so again, the reason for this parable is to teach them that the Son of Man was going to come, and they didn't know at what time, so because of that, then they were to be watchful. All right, now, I want to back up and I want you to look at something here. And that is verse 1, and again it's repeated in verse 6. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. Again, in verse 6, the bridegroom is coming. The cries make, go out to meet him. All right, now, this, and it's a phrase here to meet um, but it actually in the Greek it is and you can see it right here this is the is ice which means unto or toward or for and then this is the word here apentasis that is rendered meet to meet and this, this is the phrase that is rendered to meet and so First thing that's interesting is apentasis is a noun. But the way that it's rendered here, it sounds like an action or a verb, in other words. You're going to meet. That, that's, that's verb language. But this is a noun. So actually what he's saying is go forth for meeting. For the meeting. The meeting. Now the definite article is not there. But because it's a noun, then you can understand why I am saying that. Go forth for the meeting. Go forth to meet the bridegroom. All right, so it's a noun. Again, now, apentasis is only used three times in the New Testament. And we'll see them here. Uh, well, four times, twice right here. 
uh, it's used three other times other than this verse, but its second time is in verse 6. And we'll look at the other two places here shortly. All right, so the word means a meeting. So again, you can see the, the noun aspect of the word, a meeting, not going, it's not a verb, going. A meeting, an encounter, and then it's rendered to meet. And this, this is how Mounts uh, defines it. And then Robertson says that it comes from the verb apenteo. So here is the verb form. And so if, as you study uh, the Greek language, then you're, you're probably well aware of uh, the fact that nouns are built from the verb. So that's why he would say apentasis, the noun, comes from the verb apenteo. But now here's what is interesting, and I didn't tag those two verses. So we're going to have to go and look at them because this is interesting. I'll have to go back and correct that later. Um, so bear with me while I go to Mark 14 and verse 13. Now remember, this is on, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of this, not all of them, but I'm going to show you a couple of places where the verb apenteo is used. Mark 14 and verse 13. 14 and verse 13. He sendeth forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go you into the city, and there shall meet you. So there's the verb. They shall meet, there shall meet you, a man bearing a pitcher of water, follow him. So again, read above and below, get the context. This is when Jesus sent uh, two of the disciples to go ahead of him into the city to prepare the Passover meal. You know, they asked, Well, now how how are we going to know, you know, what to do and where to go and so forth when we get over there? And that's what he said. When you go into the city, you will be met by this young man bearing a pitcher of water. There shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Now notice what happens. And wheresoever he shall go in, say you to the good man of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber? where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared there. Make ready for us. Now, notice, please, the verb, apenteo. He told them, when you go into the city, you will be met by a man bearing a pitcher of water. Now, here's the question. When they went into the city, and again, read on down to see. When they went into the city, and they were met by this man bearing the pitcher of water, did these two disciples take, rapture, the man bearing the pitcher of water and go back to where they came from, bring him back to Jesus? Did they? No, of course not. We can see that, surely. Look at the usage of the word. They go to the city. They are met by this man bearing a pitcher of water, and the man that's bearing the pitcher of water takes them to their destination. Do you see that? The large upper room. All right, now let's look at one more. Luke 17 and verse 12. This is, again, read above and below. This is an instance where uh, Jesus heals some of the men that are lepros have leprosy. So it says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. Did Jesus take the men that were lepers and take them back to wherever he came from? No, that's not what happened. They met him there. Of course, they were healed. And he said, You go and show yourselves unto the priests. So that even though this is a little bit different in the structure of the way things uh, take place here as the previous example, I want you to notice how the verb is used from which the noun is built. All right? Now, let's get back to uh, Matthew 25. All right, now, back in Matthew 25, verse 1. We've seen the verb usage. Now let's look at the noun usage. Again, we see it down here in verse 6. The bridegroom cries made, bridegroom comes, go out to meet 
him. And now again, notice what happened when the bridegroom came. Did the bridegroom take the ten virgins and go back to wherever the bridegroom came from? Do you see that? No, that's not what happened, was it? No. The, the virgins, the five anyway, that were prepared, when the bridegroom came, they all went in together. They all went into the final destination. The virgins escorted the bridegroom to his final destination. Do you see that? I mean, that's simple. Okay, now, let's notice the other two places where this word is used. And one is in Acts 28. And this is where Paul is on his journey to Rome. All right, in verse 14, it uh, says, We found brethren and uh, were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appia Forum and the three taverns, whom, when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. Now notice, and when we came to Rome, do you see what happens here? Paul is journeying to Rome. These brethren heard he was coming. They went out to meet him. They escorted him to Rome, to his destination. Do you see that? Do you see how the word is used? All right, now let's look at the last place we find this word, and that is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, Zechariah 14. And this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming, the parousia of the Lord, shall not prevent, precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, now notice, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, the shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now notice, then we which are alive and remain unto the parousia of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be of the Lord. Now again, folks, what is, how is this word used everywhere else in the New Testament? Again, is it ever used of a person going to a destination, being met by a group of people, and then that person just turning around and going back to wherever he came from? He didn't go to his destination. Do you see that? Look at how the text uses the language. Then we which are alive and remain, he just said that we who are alive and remain until the parousia of the Lord. And he says the same thing right here. We which are alive and remain, we supply by ellipsis, unto or until the coming of the Lord, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, that's Jesus bringing the saints with him, Zechariah 14. We shall be caught up, he says, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The reason I'm showing you this and showing you how this word is used everywhere else in the scriptures is so that you can understand why this idea of Jesus coming back at the end of time, the assumed end of time, coming down here and rapturing saints, the church, and taking them back to his, where he came from. You see, that's not the definition of the word. That is not the way the word is used everywhere else in the New Testament. The word, the terminology that is used is of a dignitary, and let's, let's just read that. Let me show you this. Quote this word, apentasis. It is used in the 
Papyria of a newly arriving magistrate. It seems that the special idea of the word was the official welcome of a newly arrived dignitary. And that is Vines quoting Moulton. You'll find that in Vines under uh, the to, to meet or the meeting. I forget which one. Uh, but anyway, you'll find it there in Vines. He's quoting Moulton's Greek grammar there, and he gives you the volume and the page number. All right, so again, when we look at the way these words are used, you know, we, we could apply this thought and the way this word is used in the text to something modern day. You know, the President of the United States is on Air Force One, and he is flying to Moscow. For a meeting with the president, President Putin, okay, the plane lands and the entourage, maybe Putin is with him, but the entourage comes out to meet POTUS. Now does the president take the entourage, put him on the plane and come back? No. The entourage escorts the president to the meeting. It, they escort him to the final destination. See how the word is used? See how simple that is when we look at what the texts say and how the language is used. It, this is why that I keep telling you and keep encouraging you, please allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And again, this word, apotasis, is only used four times. Twice here in Matthew 25, then in Acts 28, and then in 1 Thessalonians 4. And in all four... Or look, Let's take three. In the other three, other than 1 Thessalonians 4, it is consistently used of an important person coming from point A to point B, but being met before they get to point B by an entourage and escorted to point B. See how simple that is? All right, so... Uh, well, I'm going to end the lesson here with these thoughts, and uh, this is plenty for you to think on, study on, pray about, and again, I just want to encourage you to study the Bible, to allow Scripture to interpret itself, and just accept what the Scriptures say in context, and this is how that we will arrive more readily in unity and harmony upon what the Bible says. We have to lay aside our emotions, our opinions, our presuppositions and bias and so forth. Lay that aside. Have the humility of heart. We're going to study the Bible and we're going to keep things in context. And even if it steps on my toes, then I'm just going to massage my toes and I'm going to accept the truth. Okay. All right. So again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate uh, new subscribers. If you're new to this uh, channel, to this series of lessons, go right down there and hit the subscribe button. And I pray that you punch the like button uh, and help to uh, get these videos out, share them with your friends and neighbors. And let's, let's just spread the gospel and encourage people to study the Bible. That is my primary goal, just to get you to study the Bible in context. Okay, until our next lesson, I pray that God will bless you richly in your study of His Word, and you have a good day.